So it gives my great pleasure to introduce our keynote address this morning by someone who I think we have all known for a long time, and that is Dr. Howard Maybach. He is Professor of Dermatology at the University of California in San Francisco, and he's talking to us about the in vitro permeation test, IVPT, historical perspective, current context, and future directions. The podium is yours, Howard. In vitro permeation has been around for 80 years. Today, it is getting more attention than in the last 80 years put together. If I don't mention your role in this fascinating technology, my apologies. We're trying to deal with a very short introduction. Slide, please. Dana, can you hear me? Okay. The big question to me is, are the audience or the audiences interested in IVPT only for bioequivalence? You will hear a great deal about that today. Or do you really want to use it for many, many other research purposes, in which case you really may want to know what is the relationship of the in vitro permeation to in vivo in man or animal, and does it really matter? They're really related but separate questions. Next, please. To the best of my knowledge, the first acknowledged master of the field was not a pharmaceutical chemist nor a dermatologist. It was a professor of internal medicine, a cardiologist, just before World War II, where he started to talk about something that at that time was called insensible water loss. Today is called TEWL, transepidermal water loss. He was studying physiology and without the advantages, advantages of all of the extraordinary electronic technology that we have today, he came up with some of the correct answers. Next slide, please. But for all practical purposes, the real impetus in terms of a bioequivalence, at least, occurred with the terrors of World War II, where there was great concern that chemical warfare agents would be used again as they were in World War I. So if any of you would like to learn what Tregear and the other people at Portland Downs did during World War II, you have to wait a generation. They didn't publish their master book. They did publish individual articles, but I highly recommend that you look at what Tregear and his colleagues did publishing 20 years later. Next. Now, if you want the real referencing to the field of percutaneous penetration, which is unbelievably fascinating, complex, and relevant to your health and well being, there are two reference books. And I realize you can't write all of this down, but it'll be online in three weeks. They both come from Hans Schaefer. The first one is in English in a German book called The Handbook of Dermatology. The, the editor was a gentleman by the name of Janison. And there are 40 pages of references in that wonderful volume highly recommended. Subsequently, with a co-author, um, Schaefer simplified it in a book called Skin Barriers and published in 96 by Cogger. Next. Now, going back to Chagir, if you take a look at this little diagram, you're going to be seeing many diagrams in the next three days. But you can see that Chagir really had the basic ideas as we understand them today. It is likely that we will continue to evolve, but if you really want to see how clever some of our forefathers and foremothers were, 
you have, have this diagram and you have the Trigear textbook. Next, please. Now, there is great interest in the relationship between the static chamber, you'll be hearing a great deal of this today, and the flow-through chamber. Some of the early workers were Answorth and Marzulli, but for practical purpose, it was Bob Renau who took over the Marzulli lab when Dr. Marzulli retired at FDA, who popularized the flow-through system. And Brunau has a book, very hard to get your hands on, called In Vitro Absorption. And um, hopefully next year there will be a new book which takes advantages of the many things that have been learned about static and flow-through systems with the cooperation of many of the people who are on this three-day conference. Next. Now, in terms of flow through, we can't go through all of the details, but we want you to know in this figure one in the Trigir textbook that Trigir already knew that by changing the flow through, the volume moving per second per minute in the chamber, he could alter the amount of chemical perfusion. The details are highly important. And again, uh, we, uh, anyone who wants to understand the basis of this, I recommend going to the original references. Next. A medical student at UCSF in 69 uh, took a look at all of the data that was available up until that time. And he came to the conclusion that Dr. O, oh, I believe, will be talking to you about today and in a recent publication a month ago, came to the same conclusion. Namely, that with the limited data that we have and with the power of that data and what we've learned about many details, including solubilities, that there was no gross or outstanding difference between the flow-through system results and the properly performed static results. And so Dr. O and his colleagues at the agency recommended that you consider the static system for a number of reasons. I recommend that recent publication for that point. Next. Now, because human skin is not available to everybody, it's relatively widely available, there is a great deal of interest in different types of membranes. And it would not be surprising in the next three days if we don't hear about why can't we use alternatives to skin. So there are two recent references that I can recommend. They're on your slide. One for synthetic membranes and the second one from Boistra, namely on engineered membranes, human skin equivalents. And it would not be surprising in the years to come because of their reproducibility, uh, which is a major advantage, that we may be able to find some partial or extensive use of these substitutes. But in the meanwhile, I think today we're gonna to be mainly hearing about human and perhaps animal skin. Next. Now, you have seen the diagram of tr what Trigir was using, but there, since his day, there have been many, many attempts, and you're gonna hear about it from different manufacturers who will emphasize the advantage of their design. The best of reference that I can give you, though, is not from Tom Franz, it's from somebody in the industry, you have the reference in the Kapanen book. It's Stephen Fran's attempt to go into the theory of the various types of designs. Much of this is theory driven. I suspect in the years to come, there'll be a great deal of comparative experimental work done to come up with the perfect design 
for each given need in in vitro penetration. Next. Now, the metrics of the penetration turned out to be a little more complicated than Tregear could have imagined. Bob Bernau added, and he's very much alive in retirement from the agency, suggesting that we normalize what do we mean by normal skin. So Bob suggested we use tritiated water, and for some years, our laboratory and many other laboratories depended upon tritiated water. Eventually, a very competent postdoc at UCSF suggested, well, maybe you don't need radioisotopes. Maybe you could do it with the very efficient and reliable evaporimeters that had become commercially available after Tregear's date. And so the Nangia method has been widely used by the overwhelming majority of the labs to determine what is normal. But I would submit that in this workshop and in the days and years to come, we're, to, we're going to redefine what we really mean by normal because there is no one single normal for individuals. We all vary greatly from the top of our head to our big toe. But in addition, there's another excellent literature on the using electrical properties to define the complexity of what we mean by normality. Next slide, please. Now, when you talk about skin absorption, uh, originally we were talking about what was in the bottom of the glass or plastic cylinder. Today, uh, it is a very much more interesting analysis because today many laboratories measure what stays on the surface, namely is not absorbed, what's in the first one, two, or three adhesive tape strips, and we have to give a great deal of thought as to how much of that was, would be absorbed and wouldn't be absorbed, what's in the remainder of the stratum corneum, what's in the epidermis, dermis, reservoir, and even in the fat. A postdoc, a doctoral student at UCSF, Dan Bucks, who may be on the phone today, introduced the concept that looking at all of these parts of human or animal skin, it would be ideal to have something called mass balance. The closer you come, to showing that you've measured 100% of what you've placed on the skin, the, the greater the integrity of the experiment. So the ideal in most of the guidelines, which we'll talk about briefly, is to approach 95%. I will not go into detail, but there are things that in vitro permeation do not address. Most specifically, the one to be emphasized is the ability to get the chemical out of your body. Otherwise, namely, excretion of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And excretion. It's for that reason that hexachlorophene, which was in 20,000 products alone in the United States, has almost disappeared. And this is something implied carefully in the new sunscreen studies. I'll refer to them as the MATA and colleague studies. And it emphasizes the fact that once chemicals get in, they don't necessarily get out very quickly. And this is going to be a major part of dermatopharmacology and dermatotoxicology in the next decade, but is not measured in this in vitro model. Next, please. Now, for those people who in in vitro assays are measuring the different compartments, the stratum corneum, epidermis, and dermis, we have a large selection of techniques going back many decades. Dr. Zhu, uh, in this particular reference, summarizes all of them including their advantages and disadvantages 
for in vitro permeation. Next slide, please. Now, we now know clearly that when you developed, each, you, each of you Homo sapiens, there's a remarkable difference between the amount of penetration on, say, your forearm, a very convenient anatomic site, your abdomen, your face, your, the, and the genitalia. Uh, there has been an attempt that for those of you who have a special site and you want that you want to use and you want to compare it to another site, Richard Guy, when he was at UCSF School of Pharmacy, has summarized a simple equation which will undoubtedly be improved upon as we get additional in vivo data to correct any oversimplifications that Richard might have made on the limited data that was available in the Brunau textbook. Next. Now, for those of you who struggle to get mass balance, I can just simply say that there is a vast literature suggesting that there are aids that are now available that were not available in the beginning of the field, let's say in Irving Blank and Tregear's era, namely cold chemistry, which is what they were dealing with, has now been advanced with radio labeling, liquid scintillation counting, et cetera. And if you want a very simplified reference, please take a look at John Cow's attempt to summarize this in 1990. Next. Now, many people use fresh skin when they can. We certainly do. But most of us depend upon frozen skin. There is going to be significant discussion in the next years and, and during this meeting. What is the difference between the two? Uh, it is an extensive literature. We and many others have been involved. But there is one technique that Bob Brunau added, a, namely a viability assay for your piece of skin or any other membrane you're using, utilizing glucose. Uh, there are many perfusates that have been used. Those that are interested in viability have stressed using tissue culture media. Uh, it is clear though, for some recent publications, the reference not given here, that there may be a significant difference, not totally documented, but two independent investigators, namely that pig frozen skin seems to be different than human frozen skin, but I'm sure that will be worked out. And many of this may turn out to be chemical specific, not generic for all chemicals. Next. Now, it is really important for those who, you want, to, who want to use in vitro permeation for things other than bioequivalents to know the relationship to in vivo data. I would refer you to one of your panelists, Paul Lehman, and here is the reference, in which using the best in vitro data that he could find, and uh, Sam Ranney and Tom Franz were co-authors, to the best in vivo data they could find, which was largely data on me, I'm not sure that's the perfect normality, and a few other volunteers in San Francisco, and they came up with the conclusion that if you have really good data and a normalized protocol, you can get reasonable harmonization. The next two slides, next slide please, show their data. This is now log transformation. Obviously that is most important. The next slide, please shows the uh, perfect fit with the best human data they could find. I would just suggest that we look forward to future prospective rather than retrospective studies to determine when this is applicable and when it may not be applicable. Next slide, please. 
Now, a key factor in recent studies, but some of the early ones were done in 1970, is what is the role not of plasma binding, that of course is very critical in terms of in vivo studies, but in terms of in vitro studies, what is the importance both for the data and the modeling of binding to the proteins in stratum corneum, epidermis, dermis, and maybe even fat, because some of the very prolonged half-lives of some skin exposures may in the end be explained by even fat. And the two references here, the early reference from Ephraim Mensel of Israel and Xiaoying Hui of UCSF. Next, please. Now, to simplify it, obviously with a little bit of humor, we now realize in vivo, in vivo, not in vitro, but it's important for the relationship of understanding some of the issues in the past with in vitro penetration is the fact that there are at least 20 separate steps in in vivo percutaneous penetration. We will not go through them, but uh, Rebecca Law, a professor of pharmaceutics in Newfoundland, uh, uh, has summarized these in 2020, and here's the reference. Next, please. These are steps six through 14. Next. And 15 through 20. And I suspect when Professor Law brings this up to date, we'll be up to 24 or 25 steps. Not to suggest that all of these are relevant to in vivo and to in vitro penetration, but they will help us refine our future developments and validity of in vitro to in vivo penetration. Next, please. Now, many people have asked, many drugs, topical drugs are applied to abnormal skin. What are the models that we can use? And what is the veracity and the translatability of those models to normal skin? So these are two um, references by a student at UCSF, uh, Dr. Gattu, now Dr. Gattu. But basically, it turns out that uh, we are optimistic that some of the models that we have, such as tape stripping, blisters, et cetera, will allow us to come up with translatable models of damaged skin, but in vitro, not having to do it all in vivo. Next. Now, if the world were perfect, and we would love it to be perfect, what can we do? What are some of the models that we could use to further validate the translatability for any of the steps of 20 of the 20 steps of in vivo percutaneous penetration? It's my judgment, and it's only in many judgments of mine have been wrong, that the comparison to some of the vasoconstrictor data given to us by Drs. McKenzie and Stoughton will be a powerful tool for further validating the relevance of in vitro systems to in vivo, and then the enormously large, elegant databases that we have in vivo for man for the 20 transdermal drugs that are widely used and is summarized by Dr. Faramond uh, when she was a fellow in San Francisco. These two databases provide elegant human in vivo data that we can compare some of the in vitro data systems to. Next slide, please. Now, the, the previous guidelines and more guidelines will be following were largely done, I was involved in two of them, as group discussions. We did the best we could on the basis of what is known, what was known at that time. 
my horoscope for the future is that because of this meeting, there are so many people involved in refining the execution and interpretation of in vitro permeation that we will come closer and closer to a very high and very useful science and that in the future it won't be a group of people sitting around a table it'll be a group of people sitting around the table with massive amounts of high quality data and that our guidances will become even more useful to the development of not only generic drugs but the development of the dermatologic sciences next slide in the last slide which will be again on the um, recordings that you get in three weeks is my email i try to answer them at seven every morning and seven every night and my cell phone the cell phone gets turned on at 7 a.m san francisco time i'm hoping though that most of the questions are going to be answered in the next three days the panel that bo is going to be dealing with in the, in the near future but please remember that is san francisco time ladies gentlemen wherever you are on the planet we wish you great luck and great success in improving our generics and improving the science of in vitro permeation which will have many uses in the decades to come. Thank you.